basically, I've got a kind of unusual presentation today. This is not your typical uh, dry technical details of what's down in the packet headers and things like this. This is the big picture. Something really interesting is going on here. We're making not just a change in one protocol like HTTP 1.0 to HTTP 1.1. Uh, this is down in the guts of the internet, uh, uh, in the internet layer, and it affects everything about it, every protocol. And this is not just a simple change, this is a generational change. Uh, the last time we went through a change like this was when we went from uh, the ARPANET which ran from roughly 1969 to 1982, to the uh, original IPv4 internet, which started in 1983. This is that level of change. It's going to affect everything. And one of the big things that uh, I've been uh, harping on for quite some time is that now that everything, including every phone, has public IP addresses, this changes everything. We can get away from centralized messaging, and we can uh, now go to true edge computing and true to decentralization. Uh, so uh, you see my little tagline down at the bottom, innovation through IPv6. That's what I've been pushing for a very long time. IPv6 is a opportunity to do innovation like we haven't seen in decades. Now, first off, uh, I had a book come out a few months ago, which is covering one half of what I'm talking about today, which uh, is on PKI, public key infrastructure, and how to use digital certificates and so on. That book is uh, for sale on Amazon. It uh, covers a ton of details of how this stuff works. And in fact, I do actually cover how to do end-to-end -end peer TLS in that. Now, more recently, I've been working on a new book, which is going to be coming out literally any day now. I just finished the final editing of the typeset copy on Sunday. This is third generation internet revealed. And uh, some of you may be familiar with my book, Second Internet, uh, that's been on IPv6 forum for some time, since 2007. Some 500,000 people have downloaded that. Well, this is bringing that up to uh, current date, and there's been a ton of development since the last revision, which was in 2010. And so th there's a lot of information in here. Uh, but this gives the big picture of what's going on with this transition and what is now possible. And so the tagline here is reinventing computer networks with IPv6. So I think a lot of people will find this interesting, and it will help you finally grasp what's going on here. Now, is IPv6 available today? Well, most, most advanced countries are now well over 50% of their internet traffic working over IPv6. And a lot of people don't even know it is happening. It's invisible to them. It's way down in the stack. In the US, 95% or more of the wireless carriers already support IPv6. It's on your phone now. If you bring up uh, uh, ability to look at the IP addresses on your phone, whether it's Android or uh, iPhone, you'll see some uh, magic IPv6 addresses. 41% of all the connections to Google.com from the entire world now are over IPv6. And this is a true generational change, like I said, going from ARPANET to IPv4 back in 1983. Uh, in ARPANET, the addresses look like 10. They were, they were simple, you know, eight-bit addresses from zero to 255. In the IPv4 world, they were 32-bit addresses, which were represented by four octets. Now in IPv6, they look a little stranger because 128 bits takes a little more cleverness to represent. We've gone to eight groups of 16 bits and encoded some of them in uh, hex. So this is what's going on here. What I'm talking about is end-to-end -end direct secure connections. Because IPv6 has 128-bit addresses, this gives you not just uh, 4.3 billion, but trillions of trillions of public addresses, essentially a limited number now. It's not really unlimited, but it's a staggeringly large number, uh, more than we'll ever use, uh, famous last words. This allows every node in the world, even phones, to have a global unique public IP address, which means it can accept incoming connections from any other node, including other phones. This is assuming no firewalls are blocking that connection. You can now run servers on any node, even on your phone. You can have an email server, an FTP server running on your phone today with an IPv6 address. More interestingly, you can make end-to-end -end connections directly from my phone to yours. No intermediary server required. That is required with IPv4 plus NAT. NAT basically forced centralization on us because if you have a 
private address, which the vast majority of people connected to the internet today have, you can't accept incoming co connections. And so basically, um, with IPv6, you can now. And so this changes everything. We've now got a flat address space, monolithic address space, and everybody can be a public address now and receive incoming connections. So I've come up with something called Peer TLS, which is a variant of the TLS or SSL that many of you know. This allows you to establish secure connections directly between any two nodes on the internet. For instance, directly from my phone to yours. Okay, so what is Peer TLS? Um, traditional client server TLS. One node is the server, which has a server certificate that identifies some node. Optionally, the client may also use a client certificate that identifies a person. More commonly, the client will identify itself with a username and password, which is ancient technology. You shouldn't be using that anymore. But my node cannot directly connect to your node. We must both connect to some intermediary server, like an email server or a chat server or something like that. IPv4 plus NAT forced this on us because most people can't accept incoming connections. In pure TLS, both nodes use a client certificate that identifies some person or device. All nodes have both a client and a server role. My node connects directly to yours. This gives you true end-to-end -end encryption uh, and mutual strong authentication with digital certificates. There's no need for any intermediary server. Who needs an email server? Who needs a chat server? Just talk directly to my phone. Most hacking and snooping takes place on the intermediary node, so they're, they're bad news. They break TLS. Any existing protocol that you can make work with TLS, like SMTP, uh, FTP, et cetera, can be made to work with peer TLS. I've actually made many of them work. This is possible only if all the nodes have public IP addresses, which is true with IPv6 for the first time in a very long time. In fact, with phones, phones have never had public addresses before. They've always had private addresses because by the time they came along and were connecting to the internet, the IPv4 public addresses were pretty much gone. They're, they're completely gone now. Intermediary servers break TLS. So TLS works okay if there's only a single link or connection between the two ends. This works okay on web, where all connections are really only one link long uh, from the browser to the server. My browser never connects to your browser. If I click on a hypertext link, my browser makes a new and different connection to a different web server. With email, FTP, and most other protocols, with intermediary nodes, we can each connect to a server and each of those connections can be secured with TLS, but there's no way for TLS to secure a path all the way from me to you. With email, there may be multiple intermediary servers between us. With direct end-to-end -end connections over IPv6, there's only one link between me and you. For email, file transfer, chat, even VOIP, using existing IETF protocols. Uh, everyone has a client and everyone has a personal server. This is not a server that can handle thousands of users, it's a server that can handle one user, you. So that's a personal server. My client connects directly to your server. Your server is running on your node. So there's no need to have a protocol like IMAP with uh, email to retrieve the message. It's already on your device. TLS can secure that one link easily. This is true edge computing or decentralized messaging. We no longer need any metering servers except maybe for delayed messages or group chat or something. This is also very difficult for anyone to snoop on, especially if it's encrypted end to end. Most interception takes place on the intermediary servers. So here we have Alice connecting directly to Bob, and both of them have a client cert, no server cert. Now, this works with existing messaging protocols, like I said. So it's a very big paradigm shift, but it works with the existing well-established proven protocols. No need to create new protocols for these to just use the existing protocols over this new way of connecting. No service provider account is required. You don't need an email account or a VOIP account or whatever. Every node has both a client and a personal server for all supported protocols. Since all nodes have a globally unique public IP address, any node can accept incoming connections. There's no NAT to stop the incoming connections as there is with IPv4. It's virtually impossible to snoop on a secure end-to-end -end connection unless you've got backdoor access to one of the two nodes. This is ideal for IoT and blockchain. This is a blockchain conference, right? Well, let's talk about blockchain. First off, IoT devices often need to communicate with each other directly as peers, not uh, ideally not via some intermediary node. With IPv6 and peer TLS, they can not only do it, but they can do it through end-to-end -end encryption and strong mutual authentication. 
And by the way, that's really good for zero trust architecture. Those of you wanting to do uh, zero trust architecture deployments, first off, start by deploying IPv6. So every node has IPv6. Now, blockchain, again, there's a need for blockchain nodes to exchange information with each other as peers. Today, that has to be done via enumerary servers if you're using IPv4 with NAT. And that breaks TLS and introduces unnecessary vulnerabilities. With peer TLS, they can communicate directly with each other as peers in a highly secure manner. Of course, every one of these nodes is going to need IPv6. So again, if you're doing blockchain, you really should be using IPv6. You know, IPv4 is ancient history. Stop being tied down by its limitations. One interesting thing is this is an opportunity for those entrepreneurs in the audience. This could be the biggest market ever for X509 certificates, dwarfing DigiCert and Trust and Septigo. And if any of you folks are there, you should be thinking about this. Every phone and every computer potentially need one. That's billions of certificates. Inexpensive client certificates that identify someone only via an email address can be provided for casual users, full automation. Premium certificates with identity or device validation, like your name and company and so on, could be provided for people that need it. This would require people to submit documents to prove their identity and so on before they're issued those uh, certificates. We can actually do belt and suspenders here. While you do pretty good end-to-end -end encryption during the connection uh, and mutual strong authentication, so both parties know for certain who they're chatting with uh, or exchanging email with or whatever, with basic end-to-end -end SMTPS and FTPS, you can also use SMIME, which is another IETF standard, to add another layer of security. And that survives the uh, connection. The messages are still secure on your node when, after you receive them until you actually open them and read them. This works with both email and file transfer. And yes, you can do FTP with SMIME. I've done it. With SMIME, the privacy and authentication remain in force after the actual connection is over. Uh, if someone gets into your message store, all the messages or files are still encrypted and you still know for certain who the sender was. That's an interesting thing to know. So you can do not only pure TLS, you can en enhance it even further with SMIME for several of the protocols. A single du dual purpose certificate can actually work for both of those things. You could also use it for uh, strong client authentication to other online services if needed. Okay, so basically that's what we're talking about here. It's a revolution in how we do messaging. And I've already proven that it works, and it's described in both of my books there. And this is a very exciting time to be uh, active in the internet and creating uh, applications. Um, there's opportunities here for innovation that we, we literally haven't seen for decades. So I hope that uh, uh, gave you some interesting uh, ideas here. And just in case you're curious, this is the little six cop program I came up with. You can see it gives you a lot more detail on what's going on on your uh, IPv6 addresses, and those are real ones on my note here.